This uh, morning or, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're watching from, my colleague Zlatko Minov uh, introduced Transmon Physics to you. And what I would like to bring to you today is, well, the Transmon's great. It makes a great qubit. We use it for all of our devices and everything. Uh, but how do we actually go about manipulating it? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, in particular, qubit drive. So what we're going to do is, uh, although we know the Transmon has higher order energy levels, we're going to treat it as a qubit just for simplicity, because that lets us, uh, that lets us um, use mathematics that are a little bit easier. Uh, such as describing the two-level system in terms of the poly matrices. So uh, Zlatko would have introduced the poly matrices to describe the basis in which you can measure qubits, but these also generate the rotations around the block sphere, and that's where um, things become a little bit more important for driving the qubit. So if we have these poly matrices, the algebra in which uh, they obey um, allows us to do calculations much simpler. In particular, their commutation relations are expressed very easily in one in terms of one another, which makes it easier to calculate. Um, so if we just treat the uh, transmon as a qubit, then we have a very simple Hamiltonian for our, cube, our transmon. Uh, it's just negative 1 half h bar omega q times the poly z ma uh, matrix, where omega q is the angular frequency of the qubit, and uh, the sigma z is this sigma z matrix up here. So what happens is um, the reason why we have a minus sign in front of there is because uh, when physicists originally started talking about the physics of spin, you assume that a magnetic field is pointing in the positive z direction. Uh, in that case, then the, uh, the spin pointing in the positive z direction has a minimum energy because it's pointing parallel to that magnetic field. However, uh, if, the, if the spin points in the negative z direction, then it's in the opposite direction as the magnetic field and it has a higher energy. And that's why in the block sphere, the uh, north pole represents the zero and the south pole represents the one. Uh, it all kind of has its origin in, fin in spin physics. But because we're dealing with energies instead of spins now, we need to put this minus sign in front of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, so we can think about this Hamiltonian in terms of uh, the block sphere, as, as I said before. And uh, we can just kind of go through, um, go through uh, what I just mentioned and said, well, we regard the ground state as the one pointing up which seems a little weird, but it's because of this historical uh, spin physics uh, story, which is why. So the excited state is the one actually pointing down because that's anti-parallel to the magnetic field. Ah, so moving on, there's another, um, an, another uh, nice thing that the poly matrices let us do, and that's to represent the uh, raising and lowering operators. Instead of those A daggers or B daggers that Zlecka was talking about, we can use these raising and lowering operators defined in terms of the poly matrix matrices. Uh, the difference here is we have that the sigma plus is equal to the one half sigma x minus i sigma y. This is opposite of the spin physics terms. And likewise, the minus um, or lowering operator corresponds to the uh, term with the plus in it. And uh, this has the effect on the qubit states that we can raise the qubit from the zero to the one state by applying the sigma plus or raising operator to it. However, we try to raise beyond the one state, we get just zero, not the zero state, but we just get the vacuum. Um, and that's because no state for this two level qubit exists outside of that. Now that's different for the transmon, of course, um, but this makes calculation simpler. Uh, likewise, if we want to lower from the one state, we can apply the lowering operator and we get the zero state. Likewise, if we try to lower beyond the zero state, we get the vacuum, which is just zero, not the zero state. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to model the electric dipole interaction, which is fundamentally how the qubit behaves with the outside world. So a lot of times we'll talk about the qubit uh, as an electric dipole or possibly an antenna, and we'll uh, express it like this in terms of this d vector, where this d vector has coefficients, uh, in general complex coefficients, that um, that are uh, coefficients of the raising and lowering operators because this field is going to act to lower and raise the qubit state. Um, the drive, as it were, is kind of like a radio wave is to an antenna. It's going to make an electric field that has an interaction with that uh, dipole. And in particular, that interaction is represented by the dipole interaction or the, the dipole term of a Hamiltonian, which is just minus the inner product of D dotted with E. So this is completely classical so far. We haven't really um, done anything quantum with it yet, uh, but you can understand a lot of uh, interactions between um, light and matter uh, in terms of this equation. So what we can do now is we can just stick those terms in there and do some math and collect these terms in terms of the raising and lowering operators. And then we're going to do um, 
Uh, we're going to go through some terms that you might go through in an early quantum mechanics class. If you're not interested in that, it doesn't matter. We'll get to a result that we'll end up using with uh, Qiskit Pulse. Uh, so right now, we're just collecting terms in terms of the raising and lowering operators because that's what it's important. And then we're going to redefine the coupling strengths in terms of these uh, omega, capital omega uh, operators, which have to do with the um, essentially the size of the dipole and the strength of the field that's driving. And we're just going to substitute those with these omegas. And uh, we get Planck's constant in here. That's kind of how you can see that things are becoming more quantum. So the next thing we're going to do is make the rotating wave approximation. And this is a very useful way of, uh, of representing interactions um, with the qubit because it gets rid of higher order terms and it allows you to see kind of the most essential physics that's happening. So this is what we're going to do. So first of, first of all, we're going to move the Hamiltonian, which was in the Schrodinger's picture. Uh, so that means the, the state, the, the time dependence was coming on to the states of the wave functions. Now we're going to move to the interaction picture where we're moving into the rotating frame of the qubit. And because we're moving into the rotating frame of the qubit, we, we have some extra terms that end up canceling. So we have an easier uh, picture of what this transformed Hamiltonian looks like. So this will be the drive Hamiltonian and the interaction picture is multiplied by these unitary matrices. And these unitary matrices uh, are uh, represented by e to the i h t over h bar, where h q is the qubit Hamiltonian that we started with. Uh, and what, what happens is because we're using the, um, the poly matrices is we have a, when we exponentiate, when we um, exponentiate this Hamiltonian to generate rotations, we actually get a relatively simple expression for what is, uh, what is going on with that rotation. And that's in terms of these uh, cosine and sine terms where the cosine is multiplied by the identity matrix and the sine term in this case is just multiplied by the sigma z matrix. Uh, so when we calculate those terms from going into the interaction picture, essentially what happens is this uh, sigma plus term uh, gets sandwiched by these, uh, um, by these exponentiated terms. And what you end up getting out when you do the calculation is you just get the sigma plus term back, but you get an I, e to the i omega qt, where omega q is, again, the, the angular frequency of the uh, qubit. Uh, likewise, when you do the same thing with sigma minus, you get the same thing with sigma minus, but now you get minus i omega qt. And this is kind of the... Um, main result that comes out of going into this interaction picture is then we can transform our, our Hamiltonian to this picture where you have the, uh, the, ex the exponents of both the drive frequency and the qubit frequency um, in the exponents uh, multiplied by the drive strength, capital omega. Okay, so next slide, we're going to start with that um, same Hamiltonian. I haven't done anything yet to it. And we're going to make something called the rotating wave approximation. And what that is, is it, it says when we look at these um, and these, these are complex exponentials. So these are, in fact, in, in effect, sinusoids. And it turns out, because we're going to drive near the qubit frequency, omega q minus omega d is a pretty small quantity, which means we have a slowly oscillating term. It doesn't vary much over, uh, over the time frame of the interaction that we're dealing with. However, when we have um, uh, the, the terms of the sum in them, we have much faster rotating terms, because omega q plus omega d is going to be you know, around twice the qubit frequency. That's much, much uh, larger than, than something around zero. And so these are going to be fast oscillating terms with, that have uh, uh, terms that tend to cancel out on the long time frames in which we're looking at the dynamics. So the rotating wave approximation consists of taking those terms and then just cr crossing them out. And once we do that, we make a substitution back to uh, a delta Q is the difference between omega Q and omega D, the, the, the exponential terms we keep, then we arrive at the rotating wave approximation Hamiltonian. Um, so we're just left with these two terms instead of the four terms we had before. So everything just got a little bit easier. And then we can take that and transform back to the Schrodinger picture. So in effect, we've undone the unitary uh, change that we made before, and we've gotten rid of the omega Qs in the, uh, in the exponents to reveal the drive uh, frequencies. Uh, so this looks a little bit more like the original one. Um, so now that we're at this picture, we can go and write down the total qubit Hamiltonian by just writing down the one minus one half h bar omega q times the poly z matrix uh, in front of that. And this is kind of the result at which we arrived at. But what we can do is we can make this a little bit simpler to understand by assuming that the drive is real and then transforming back into the frame of the drive. Um, and that allows us to kind of see what the effects on qubit dynamics are quite a bit easier. So by assuming it's real, we can combine those two terms. And we, by moving into the, the this is now the, uh, moving into the frame of the drive. So we're multiplying, we're, we're doing a uniform, a, a unitary transformation uh, with these UDs, which represent the, uh, the drive field. 
So we have this extra term involving the time derivative of that unitary as well, which ends up giving us the difference uh, between the qubit and the uh, drive terms in that sigma z Hamiltonian. So essentially we have two things going on here. We have this first term, which came from the energy um, of the qubit, um, which has been uh, coupled with the, or combined with the drive Hamiltonian to produce this sigma q here, which is the detuning between the drive and the qubit. And, we, and that produces a z rotation. And then we have a drive term, which comes from the uh, capital omega, which is the strength of the uh, combination of the strength and the drive and the dipole. And uh, that's multiplying a sigma x. So that's generating x rotations around the block sphere. So basically what this means is we can think of the terms where we're on resonance, which means omega q is equal to omega d. In that case, delta q is equal to zero. Then all we have is a Hamiltonian that wrote that where the drive rotates around the x-axis uh, of the block sphere. However, when we have something off resonance, we have an always on z rotation that comes on, on top of that. And so what we're going to do in this lab is we're going to look at these two cases and we're going to be doing, um, I'm doing this with Kiskit Pulse and we'll uh, go through a case using uh, one of the live pulse enabled uh, backends and then we'll have homework uh, based on a simulator. So I'll go through um, all of this with you right now, but um, I think you'll get the picture. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of explore how this works. So. In the case where we're on resonance, we, we call this a Robbie drive uh, for if you're an experimentalist. And uh, essentially what happens is your effective Hamiltonian becomes uh, X, rotations of the block, X rotations around the block sphere with a strength of omega, which represents that combination of the drive Hamiltonian and drive strength. Um, so uh, what we can do for Kiskit Pulse um, is we can start importing the necessary libraries. I'm gonna kind of show you how to go through and then um, in the homework I'll give you a kind of summary of a lot of these things, but the guided exercises will kind of get your hands dirty and, um, and you'll get to kind of explore without having to uh, learn too much of all the syntax and, and uh, uh, gory details of, of Kiskit Pulse. Uh, but what I'd first like to do is just kind of uh, import, the, um, uh, import the Jupyter tools that we'll be using. And I'm gonna import my account. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at uh, the open accounts, which is IBM Q, uh, open main and the backend IBM Q RMOC, which is pulse enabled. So if I execute that, then I can uh, load my account and I see my uh, credentials already in use, which makes sense. And I want to verify that this backend is pulse enabled. So I can just go ahead and execute this block. And since it didn't yell at me for not obeying, not supporting pulse, um, I know I'm good. Uh, now on the uh, quantum computing uh, or IQX website, you can see um, on the sidebar which uh, backends are pulse enabled or not. So that's a little bit easier whether than ask, having Kiskit ask for you. So we need to take some other things. And in, in fact, one of the things that, that we first find in, in pulse is we need to know what the sampling rate is. That will give us our time spacing uh, for which we can create waveforms. And it's kind of one of the most fundamental things we can do. So we want to ask uh, our monk, what is its sampling time? And we find that our sampling time is uh, corresponded to a DT of 0.2222 nanoseconds, uh, which corresponds to a sampling rate of 4.5 gigasamples a second. So this is inherently uh, has to do with the electronics and it, it tells you what kind of bandwidth you have uh, on the signals that you can process in the lab. So we, uh, we can do anything essentially that is allowed by the electronics, but the electronics do have limitations that we have to consider on. Okay, so uh, then we're going to take care of importing some other uh, useful uh, libraries such as NumPy uh, used for numerical calculations, um, some prefixes for, um, uh, for SI units, and um, an estimate of our center frequency that we're going to get from the backend. So we're actually asking in this case, the backend, what is its frequency? It's calibrated on a daily basis and we see it's about uh, 4.97 gigahertz, which is uh, you know typical. Okay. So uh, now we're going to start importing the, uh, the, the more Pulse libraries. So um, from Kiskit, we can import Pulse and we can have a symbol. A symbol is what's going to create our schedules or kind of our, our, our equivalent of circuit programs in, in Pulse. Uh, and we're going to build things using Play, which executes a uh, Pulse on a channel, and the Pulse library, which allows us to create Pulses using uh, predetermined libraries so we don't have to actually put in our Pulses sample by sample. Um, so we're gonna create necessary channels. These are not all the channels that you can use, but these are all the channels we'll need to do a basic experiment. And we have three of them here, the, the drive channel, which is generally the on resonance or, or near resonance qubit channel. 
uh, the measurement channel, which is um, something we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about tomorrow. Uh, we're not going through the intricacies of the measurement right now, uh, but that needs a separate channel and that will operate at a different frequency, uh, typically around seven gigahertz. And then we have an acquire channel, which is not quite a pulse itself, but rather a uh, tells the digitizer to know when to sample the measurement pulse that returns to it so that it can analyze that signal and determine whether a zero or one was measured uh, in the actual measurement. So what we're doing in this case, and this is where uh, this difference differs slightly different from the exercises, is because this is a real back end, what I can do is just go to the defaults and I can ask the I can ask the back end what is its default measurement and just assume that I'll make that measurement. Whereas we'll have to construct that ourselves in the exercise because we'll be using a simulator. So uh, what we can then do is start to um, create something we call a Rabi sequence. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to have a fixed, um, we're gonna have a fixed pulse width with a Gaussian shape uh, where the, essentially the, the, the length of the pulse is eight times the sigma of that Gaussian. Uh, but for what the Rabi pulse, uh, what we're specifically going to construct is a series of different amplitudes. And by constructing a series of different amplitudes, we have, uh, we're essentially changing for each experiment that capital omega that was in the Hamiltonian so that we drive the qubit more and more around the block sphere with each successively uh, increasing amplitude. So going from zero where we leave the qubit at zero because we haven't done anything to it, all the way to a maximum of 0.75 where we've rotated the uh, qubit probably a number of times around the block sphere by then. We store all these amplitudes into a um, NumPy um, uh, lint space array here, uh, which we'll use later to construct the Rabi schedules uh, on this slide in, in particular. So um, we're going to drive the qubit at its frequency. Like I said, this was an on resonance drive section. And then we're going to follow by a measurement. And the only thing that we're going to change is the amplitude of the drive we're using. And this is very common in um, quantum computing experiments, is in, often in order to get the parameters of a, uh, of a specific qubit device. Uh, we wish to just uh, do the same experiment while varying a single parameter and then fitting that to a model that we can then extract. And this is going to show you uh, kind of some of the basic uh, experiments that, that we, do, uh, we, we do very often. So in order to do our Rabi schedules, we're gonna create an empty list, and then we're gonna go through that, uh, that array of drive amplitudes. And for each one of those drive amplitudes, we'll create a Gaussian pulse using the pulse library from, from, uh, from Qiskit Pulse here. And that's gonna have a duration of drive samples, an amplitude of drive amp, a sigma of drive sigma, all those things that were defined on the previous slide, and we're just gonna name it according to the drive amp. And then for this schedule, we're just gonna call it this schedule, and we're going to create a new pulse schedule uh, with this name. And then we're going to play the Rabi pulse out on that drive channel that we've already created um, on one of the first slides. And so that will add this Rabi pulse to this schedule uh, onto the correct channel. And then we need a measurement pulse there. And this is where something gets a, a little different. So you might know this plus, my, plus equals uh, notation. This means it's going to take this schedule and add measurement to this schedule and save it as this schedule. So it's going to concatenate measure, but what is also going to happen is this schedule dot duration is going to shift the start time of the schedule so that we uh, start at the beginning of the schedule essentially. Um, so that's kind of a way that we're keeping track of time. Um, right now, I know this is actually going to change pretty soon for Pulse and uh, become a little bit more Pythonic, but this is what we have for now. Um, then to that uh, array of, um, sorry, list of Robbie schedules, we're just going to append these schedules and create a list. So. What we can then do, and I brought this up first because sometimes this can take a long time to generate, is we can just look at one of these Robbie schedules looks like using this draw function on the schedule. And I just chose the last one, which has the maximum amplitude here. You can kind of see, or it's a little hard to see because I'm using a dark mode um, with the Jupyter Notebook. But uh, you can see a, a large uh, qubit drive pulse here with an amplitude of 0.75. This uh, is a scale factor, and it has to be less than one. Um, but it, of course, depends on the exact specifics of the uh, waveform generators to and uh, RF synthesizers to what the actual voltage that corresponds to is. Uh, then we have a me measurement channel down here. Uh, we can see it a little bit better. Uh, so this measurement channel is an actual physical pulse. Uh, we're not gonna be var varying this at all. We're just gonna leave it alone. Uh, but what's important is that we have an acquisition pulse that's happening at the same time. So that's gonna allow us to do our measurement. The main thing we wanna do is change this uh, blue pulse. And if you can see it, it's a little hard to say, this blue pulse is on channel D0, which ch stands for drive of qubit zero. Uh, the acquire is uh, A0 for acquire qubit zero and M0 for measure qubit zero. So these are the uh, kind of channel names that, that you use uh, to describe these. Okay, 
And then uh, what we're going to do is create our program um, by forming a quantum object, which is essentially assembles our schedules into all the other necessary information we need to run a program. Uh, so in particular, uh, for this program, we need to know the Robbie schedule. So that kind of tells us what the experiment does. But then we need to know what backend we're running it on. So this will be Armonk here. Uh, we're going to do measurement level one here and return averages, although we're talking about measurements tomorrow. So I'm not going to go into the details of those. Uh, for each one of these experiments, we'll do a shots, which is the number of averages we do per experiment. Uh, and then for the uh, local oscillators, we can change the uh, drive frequency using um, this term. This is actually just going to drive um, always at the center frequency of the qubit, which means it's an on resonance drive for each one of the Rabi points. Okay, so um, you can run this on a real device, in which case you would want to uncomment these four lines. Um, but in the interest of doing this lab live, I have already run these results on Armonk, and I can retrieve the job by um, using this backend.retrieve job, using, then using the specific job ID that I printed out up here. Um, and if you go to your account, you can see the job IDs for all the jobs that you've run under your account before. So it's a nice way of keeping track of your experiments. Okay. So um, now that I have the job, I can get the results from that. And uh, essentially then from those results, I need to uh, do some, I need to essentially get those results and I need to subtract some background information and scale things correctly so that everything looks nice on my dark background, um, which you might want to get rid of if you're not using one of these. Okay, so uh, I'm going to store all my data as actually Robbie values and I'm going to extract this from memory from the Robbie results that I get. So I'm just going to go through the number of Robbie points I have. Uh, get memory for each one of those, and uh, corresponding to qubit zero, multiplying it by the scale factor, and then appending it to um, uh, to this list. And I'm just going to take the uh, real parts of that, actually. So when I uh, execute this, I should see a Rabi curve, which this is great. So I'm rotating around the um, I'm rotating around the block sphere. So when I apply no drive, I'm still at the zero state. However, I uh, when I start applying higher and higher and higher drives, I start getting towards the south pole where the one state is. So um, you can tell it's the one state because I've gotten down to the bottom and I'm starting to come back. So we know the one state corresponds to here. And here we're back at the zero state and we're coming back down to the one state here. But in particular for a Rabi drive, what we're interested in doing is seeing what kind of amplitude it takes for us to drive between the zero state and the one state. And actually that's how you form your X gate uh, in the circuit model. Uh, and that's one of the more Im important kinds of parameters we need to determine, and this will be determined essentially in each one of our calibrations so that we can return uh, the circuit level gate model to you as well. This is what's happening on the actual pulse level. Okay, so now we want to fit that curve and extract the parameters of interest. So we're going to use another uh, numeric um, Python package called scientific Python, SciPy, and especially curve fit. Uh, this will allow us to fit a function, and in particular, we're going to fit it to a sinusoid here. Uh, which I've defined, and um, once we do that, we can fit to that, and we can calculate and see what our pi pulse is, which is going to be uh, half of the drive period. The drive period would be the phase between 0 and 360 degrees, but we want 0 and 180 degrees, so that's, that's why it's drive period over 2. And now that we see that, we can uh, save that pulse uh, amplitude for later, we can create our own pi over 2 pulse, which is necessary for the next experiment. So we can see the pi amplitude is uh, 0.256, and we want the next drive amp, or x 90 degree, to correspond to a pi over 2 or 90 degree rotation um, to have half of that pi pulse. So we can create our own um, we can create our own pulse uh, here using uh, Kiskit pulse and the, and the Gaussian function to have a similar, quite a similar shape pulse as to the one we did in the Rabi, but with the particular drive amplitude that, that drives you to the pi over two or the equator of the block sphere. Uh, so this is going to be useful in the next section, which is going to be an off resonant drive, which is something we call a Ramsey experiment. And we usually call this a Ramsey experiment because in the beginning we don't have quite a uh, great idea of what the qubit frequency is, um, where you're, we know we're close enough to drive it, um, but we're going to be off somewhat in frequency. And by driving off resonance, um, we can pick up the term corresponding to the sigma z and figure out how far detuned we are in frequency. So this is a very useful experiment. And it also kind of gives you an idea of the time dynamics of the qubit, which is, is interesting. So we're dealing with time dynamics. I need to start with a time array. So we're going to be going between uh, 0 0.1 microseconds and 1.8 microseconds, and uh, sorry, 0.1 microseconds and 1.8 microseconds. 
in steps of 0 0.025 um, nanoseconds. And remember that the uh, step time is 0.22 nanoseconds. So this is a lot larger than our actual step size. And we're going to do something similar. We're going to create sort of Ramsey schedules, except instead of amplitudes, we're going to vary the delays. And then uh, what the Ramsey schedule, what the Ramsey experiment consists of is a pi over two pulse, which puts the qubits on the equator. And then you wait by a different increment. So you have a different amount of delays, and then you rotate by another pi over two pulse. And it turns out that because of these Z rotations, uh, due to the off resonant drive, you're going to get oscillations and your readouts that you can then fit and determine how far off you were driving. So kind of we do the same thing where we come up with a new schedule. We name it after the delay uh, between the two pulses. So we add a the X90 pulse that we just made to our drive channel uh, to this new schedule. But then we do it again. And the little trick here is now, well, we want to change the delay. So you know that we added this schedule dot duration to the timing last time. We can add the delay to that by putting um, adding the delay to it here. And in particular, that delay needs to be in, in integer form. So we put the integer around the delay to enforce that this delay will be an in, in integer. And then we can just add the measurement to this in the same way. Um, so uh, each one of these always has a this schedule dot duration shift. And when you want to add an extra delay, you can just add it with the sum with the plus sign uh, like that, and then append it to the list as you've done before. Okay, so I did this before again, but uh, our um, Ramsey schedules and essentially the one that the, is the furthest time apart uh, is going to be given by the minus one in the array. And I draw that, I see the acquire channels here and the measurement channel here. Uh, dark mode turned out to look better in this one. Um, and then on the drive channel, we can see a much smaller pulse than we had before, which is true because that was the largest pulse we were using. Then the, that was much larger pulse than the one that takes us from zero to one, and then we're using half that amplitude. So these pulses are a lot smaller than the ones that were being used or the, the large ones we saw for the Rabi pulse. Uh, for example. But now we have this different spacing between these two poles, and that's going to be what is changing in this kind of experiment. So uh, as we continue, we're going to do a number of averages for each different delays, 256. And in particular, we're going to detune by 2 megahertz. So we can explicitly do that by changing our Ramsey frequency to be detuned from the center frequency. So this is specifically an off-resonant drive. And then we can assemble our program into a quantum object we call Ramsey program. It has to do with the back end, number of shots, measurement levels. And the only difference here is the schedule LOs here is going to be now, um, it's going to be dependent on the Ramsey frequency. So that's going to be the same for all of them, except, um, so the only thing that's changing is the time between them, but the the, uh, the drive frequency is going to be the same detuned by two megahertz drive off here for each one of the schedules. And then we can run that on a real device um, using a similar kind of method, or we could run it, say, weeks ago and see that we already have um, the job. So we'll do that. And let me just make sure I executed everything I needed to. Yes. I think I just missed that. Okay, and then we uh, can get the results and um, append the uh, values, essentially extract the, the data from the experiment and add it to our array and then start fitting parameters uh, to it. So this is going to be, again, a sinusoid fit function using um, SciPy. And then we're going to extract the, uh, the detuning frequency from that, which is going to be the frequency of that oscillation. So by doing the scatter and fitting the Y, by to it, um, because we fit this, this, this red line to it already, we can tell from the period of that that it corresponds to a frequency of 1.99 megahertz, which is extremely close to the two megahertz that we detuned by. So this is, allows you to, to see how far off resonant you're driving the qubit. Um, and these are two of the most important experiments uh, that I wanted to use to essentially highlight qubit drive. Uh, and this will lead right into the um, uh, right into the exercises. So let me give you a brief overview of those, and uh, and then you can take it from there. So um, what we have is a uh, another Jupyter notebook called Exercise One, and things are going to be a little bit different here, mainly because um, um, because instead of all of you using the real devices, uh, 
we're very happy to have a lot of you, but it puts a little limits on what we can do. We're going to use a pulse simulator instead of an actual device. But you are free to go and use Armonk or any other uh, pulse-enabled uh, backend you want to. When you want to, we just didn't want to make it part of the. Uh, uh, we didn't want to make your your. Uh, it, it dependent on the grade that you're getting for this notebook. Uh, so you might need to install some necessary packages. So we're going to have a requirements.txt um, uh, here for you to add libraries to make sure we're on the same page. And then uh, we're going to come back to what Zacco was talking about this morning. And that's uh, treating the transmon as a duffing oscillator. This is kind of the, one of the most easy ways to uh, understand the transmon. Uh, and, and essentially what the parameters of the transmon are, the frequency, which is represented by nu here instead of omega because it's not the angular frequency, and uh, alpha, which is the anharmonicity as, as opposed to delta, uh, which we use for the angular anharmonicity. So that represents the essentially the 0, 1 level and then the difference between each successive level and that level. And then the drive term is written here um, by a drive strength D capital T. So this is kind of the drive of the amplitude uh, that you apply with pulse. And then R here is given by the native coupling. So this would be like the dipole coupling that's, that's inherently um, essentially built into the device itself. And then A plus A dagger represent the excitations with the photons um, there. So we've replaced the sigmas with A's to represent that this is a transmon now, but the idea is the same. They do the same kinds of things, but this represents uh, a transmon that can have higher order levels. Um, so just wanted to uh, show that this is, now we're going back to the transmon picture, but you don't really have to worry about this Hamiltonian because now we're gonna be doing things experimentally. Uh, so then I just wanted to give you a kind of overview of the pulses. So Essentially, the Qiskit Pulse has uh, uh, schedules, which, which is another word for kind of experiments, and those consist of instructions, um, such as play. You want to play a pulse, and they act on channels, such as drive channels. Uh, that's kind of what we went through before. This kind of summarizes it in a nice way, um, and this was published on the recent paper, um, recent manuscript that appeared on the archive on Qiskit Pulse. Um, for more details, if you want to know exactly what's going on on the experimental side, you can see where these signals are actually being mixed together and how they get to the quantum device and back um, for, for the other physicists in this crowd. And then um, what I wanted to say is we think it's more instructive instead of going through API documentation, it's better to kind of go through guided programming. And so uh, we're going to take you through the simulator here, um, but you can also go to IBM Q Armonk and start playing with real hardware. Uh, this is pulse enabled and this is um, open for everyone. Um, so in order to get started, we're going to need to press shift enter on each one of these code blocks. There's a lot more to get set up with in Qiskit Pulse typically because there's a lot more parameters that we can variable. Since you have a lot more power in Qiskit Pulse, which means you have a lot more responsibility to make sure you exercise all those code blocks. However, I, I did want to make, um, make sure you didn't get distracted from um, the the lessons that we really want you to take home regarding Qiskit Pulse. So I included this helper module, which I've kind of swept under the rug, a lot of the uh, methods that you don't really need to pay attention to for this assignment. Um, I'm just gonna call them from this other Python library that's included in the zip file. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is create a backend uh, simulator and instantiate as a duffing oscillator. We're going to import uh, libraries for numerics and visualization, and then you're going to have your first exercise. And your exercise is going to be create a Rabi schedule for this simulator. And um, we've got a code block here, and I've kind of given you some methods on what to do uh, to, uh, to show you um, kind of what to do. So I think it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, and then we're going to take that, um, that um, method that you wrote, and we're going to use it to build a list of schedules to run an experiment on. And then you're going to go through all of these things. You will be graded on uh, the, the schedule that you come up with. Um, so you need to make sure you execute this block or execute all the blocks. And then um, I'm using this helper module to kind of clear things under the, sweep things under the rug so that we don't get distracted. And then you can, uh, you can fit the Robbies to that same experiment and do everything very similarly as to what I did on Armonk before. Uh, we'll keep an X90 pulse that we found out from, from there, and then we'll do a similar kind of Ramsey experiment, although with slightly different parameters because this is a simulator and not a real device. And your exercise 1B is to build the schedule for the Ramseys here. Um, so I think um, by going through all of this, you'll get a good feel for how to construct a pulse schedule. And if you have any more, if you want uh, any more additional resources, um, we have a couple sections in the Kiska textbook that will go through and show you exactly how these are working. And then there's a couple of videos that you can watch, um, kind of an overview of my colleague, Lauren Capoletto, 
uh, who gave a quantum coding uh, seminar. And then um, I gave a recent seminar that was a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more meant for uh, researchers in the field about um, Pulse. So um, with that, I hope that um, you can start enjoying programming um, quantum computers uh, at the Pulse level, just like I do. And uh, I uh, like to thank Brian for running all these things, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow.